And good morning. Thank you for joining us. I am Tamara Scott. It is Wednesday when we usually tape or do the show actually live. And if you're listening online, we thank you for that. Webcast1live.com is how we're powered. The show is Tamara Scott Live. If you want to ever watch an archive, you can go to YouTube right now and just check out an archive. Uh, Truth for Our Time is what we also call it because that's what we bring you in God's Word. We're bringing you God's Word in today's world and helping you when the headlines hit home. There is always hope. There is always truth if we'll take time to seek it. And if he's um, expected us how to, to live through it, he's directed us how to do it. And so that's what we try and do in this show. Taking a little bit of a, um, uh, uh, a different avenue the last couple of weeks, and of course we focus on Common Core very much on this show right now. Common Core is something that's taking over the nation through the public schools. It is simply one more bad education reform wrapped up in a new name. This one is a bit more aggressive, learned from the mistakes of past education reform programs. It's heavy into corporate funding, heavy into corporate backing with the Chamber of Commerce. Bill Gates is funding a great deal of it, funding the Chamber of Commerce. He's funding several, uh, whether it's the National uh, Governors Association or the Chief of State Schools, whatever those groups are that originally came up with the Common Core standards. we will help you learn more about that. And if you ever want to know more, you can email us at stopcommoncoreiowa at gmail.com. But you can also get on our website or our Facebook page, excuse me, Stop Common Core in Iowa. And we will help you connect with someone, no matter what state you're in, even those original states that didn't take the Common Core, there are groups to fight the Common Core because it continues to come in and be foisted on even independent school districts where states have said no. It's coming to independent school districts as well through grants and through programs. So we have uh, people we can connect you with across the nation to help you learn more about standing against the Common Core. Here's, Here's in a nutshell. It is another intrusive government takeover of education that will remove local control and parental rights, period. That's that's what it is. So we'll help you get information on that if you like. Uh, I'm going to jump right in today with our guest, and, and I'm I'm a little bit excited. Uh, this is a person that I've gotten to know over the years and had the um, ability to interview from time to time and just been so impressed and pleased and honored just to get to know the work that they they do. I'm going to interview Basil Baz, and I, I have to apologize because I, I sometimes don't remember I, if it's Baz or Baz, but um, I'll ask him when we get him on the on the on the uh, air here, but he is a Citadel graduate, a former U.S. Marine counterterrorism officer, a CIA intelligence special operations group officer, film and television writer, producer, and founder of the Association of the Recovery of Children, which, by the way, he humbly acknowledges a 100% success rate in the recovery of those kids that they have gone to help. Baz, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Tamara. It's good to be here. And tell me, is it Baz or Boz? You, you know, either way you want to say it, it's fine. It's like Tamara. I get called about everything short of tomato, and I really don't care if the tone is pleasant as long as we can move forward and have good dialogue. So thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate you taking time out. Thank you. Let's talk to our viewers and our listeners. We have some folks who may be on Webcast One live watching, and we have some who may be hearing it later via radio. Let's tell them a little bit, what is ARC, Association for the Recovery of Children? ARC is a 501c3 nonprofit organization of former law enforcement, military, and intelligence officers who are dedicated to the safe recovery of missing, abducted, and abused children, both from the United States and, of course, globally. And, of course, our services are offered at no uh, cost to the, if it's a custodial or non-custodial situation or a guardian situation, uh, there's no cost to those parents or those guardians for our services. So then how do you get funded? The 501c3 is what's necessary to keep you going? It is. uh, We're funded through donations um, around the country, and that sustains us to run operations. Operations average in cost differently depending on where uh, the mission takes us. If If it's a U.S. mission, the cost may be less than, let's say, a child that was abducted to, I don't know, Africa, or Tunisia, South America, someplace like that. And where are some of those um, exotic or faraway places where you've gone to rescue children? 
The most exotic was actually just this past uh, Memorial Day. We uh, sent a uh, three-man team down into the center of Mexico to um, rescue a 14-year-old girl that was uh, originally kidnapped and sent down to an area of heavy trafficking. And um, it was it's run that entire region is run by the cartel. So uh, it was probably one of the quickest uh, operations we had put together. And uh, and it was what we call a Red Sea opening. This is where, biblically speaking, God basically opened the Red Sea for Moses and the Israelites to pass through. Well, when you have an operation that runs that smooth in the middle of cartel country uh, and one thing opens after another to safely get you and your team home with the 14 year old. We called a Red Sea opening, which was in in this case, which was exactly what happened. Uh, we were blessed enough to have a group of investors out of the state of Iowa, who actually uh, contacted us along with the Department of Protective Services from Iowa to ask us to assist them in this case. And of course, they funded this as well. Uh, so it was a success, successful operation. We're thankful. Well, wonderful. We're pleased pleased to hear that Iowa can help in that way. So we. We just kind of made the jump because we were talking about kids who may be in a custody battle, uh, parental issues. But if this was a trafficking issue, then this was not necessarily a custodial. This is more of the human trafficking side that you also work with. It, you know, it was half and half. In this case, it's interesting that the it was a biological father, not a, not the custodial father, but the biological father who actually abducted uh, the 14-year-old daughter and her cousin got them into Mexico, extorted the family for money, and threatened never to return them if money wasn't paid. Of course, the family paid that money. The boy was sent home, and he kept the girl. And then he abandoned the girl for a, uh, a number of months in a certain city uh, that is known for trafficking. So here you have a 14-year-old girl who does not speak Spanish, who is in a high, uh, high trafficking area, who was just, it was just a matter of time before she was to walk from point A to point B that probably five or six locals would have picked her up and we would have never seen her again. Um, and so, uh, you know, we generally, and the sad part about uh, this arena that we work in is that we're generally going after cases where children and sometimes young adults are already being trafficked. Uh, in this case, we made a decision to go after somebody before that happened, so, right. uh, which, is, which is a blessing to have that opportunity to prevent that from ever occurring. So. And so, uh, first off, thank you. Thank you for the work that you do on behalf of all the kids that you have managed to rescue. And I want to clarify again, you've, you have a 100% success rate of every child you've gone after. You have successfully brought them back, and I will add, without someone being injured, uh, that's correct. We've we've been really blessed with that. And now there, there's a caveat in that we have gone uh, and unfortunately gone into operations where it was too late. And so once you got somewhere where children were being trafficked, those children were no longer alive. That's the sad side of things. So, um, But the children that have been alive uh, in the operations we've gone on, we've been blessed to have 100% success rate in it. Every child we've gone after, we've brought home. And when we talked at one point, you knew where I think 12 children were that needed rescued, but you couldn't go because you didn't have the funding. How is the scenario right now? Are there children that you know about that you could go after if you had funding? Oh, definitely. We, we are swamped daily with uh, requests and files, and uh, we have the opportunity to locate those people. We know where they are. But again, it is just simply a matter of being able to get the team on a plane to go from point A to point B to run the operation and get back home. That's generally it. Keep in mind that none of our operators receive a salary, uh, nor do they receive payment. Um, the honorable part of our organization has always been and probably will always be the fact that we do this because this is what God has called us to do. And so we leave that in his hands. But um, we would love to be sustainable to the point where we ran teams 24 7 and that's all we did but like every other human being in the united states you have to pay your bills so we work our day jobs 
and then we run our operations based on the donations and sometimes money we pull out of our own pocket to uh, um, help with that. So it's all volunteers, actually, when you go on your missions. And so you mentioned that they're military, that they are law enforcement. I know your faith, your worldview uh, of the people on this team. Are, are most of them or all of them born again as well? Uh, generally speaking, all are or all have some relationship with God. And I think that uh, it oftentimes gets strengthened when they see the hand of God and the miracles that take place. They certainly know where I stand uh, they are certainly either courteous or their hearts have been mellowed to the point where they participate in prayer. Uh, they are believers. Um, and then again, you know, no man knows another man's heart. So right. I don't know the, 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 I don't know what they do at night when they go sure. home. But generally speaking, when we're on the road, um, they understand that God's spearheading all of this, and uh, and they act accordingly. Okay, and so thank you for the work that you do. For those who are listening, it is ARC, Association for the Recovery of Children. How can people get in contact with you if they would like to? Uh, we have a website. Uh, you can go to www.recoveryofchildren.org, and also you can go to Association for the Recovery of Children Facebook, and... Uh, we have our, uh, our address. They can get in touch with us that way. Um, if they choose to donate, there's a, there's a way they can donate. Um, and uh, if they need to get in touch with us in reference to an abduction or information that they've acquired in reference to trafficking, they can certainly send that information to our P.O. box or contact us on the Facebook. We, don't, uh, we generally don't maintain a direct telephone number to uh, to allow people to access that, um, the phone would be ringing off the hook literally all day long. So we uh, we keep that for special uh, events, special occasions, and the people that we're in the middle of the operation for. All right. And again, I just can't imagine what some of the things, some of the situations you find yourself in, some of the uh, that you have to deal with. I, I We need to keep you in our prayer. So for those listening and watching, please keep ARC and those volunteers in your prayer. And one more question on ARC, and then we'll move forward. Are there women on the team? Do you ever find uh, it necessary to take a woman into the rescue situation? We do. Uh, in fact, uh, we had an operation last year in the Philippines where um, one of our female operators went along with us, and she was invaluable. Um, and I salute her. her. Her actions in the field were amazing, and they greatly contributed to the safe rescue of a child that had been abducted uh, to the Philippines, and we were able to return that child to uh, to the United States. Um, so, yes, we do. And I met you at one of the conferences here in Iowa on human trafficking. Um, uh, the Cedars Foundation, Tony Nassif, has those here occasionally in the state, and I think there may actually be one coming up in 2014 in the fall. Um, the work that you do helping with trafficking victims when you have, I guess, if we're going to segue here, one of the reasons I called you, Baz, is that um, what we're seeing in America today, we just had primaries in several states across the nation, and I know we want things to be corrected. We want to think that things are going to get better in D.C., and, and oftentimes we're incredibly disappointed over a primary, or maybe we're pleased and hopeful over a primary. I've come to the conclusion that while all of that is necessary, it's necessary for the laws that we have, it's necessary to procure the ability and the freedom to continue to evangelize and, sh and share the faith, um, the, the, the correction for our nation is going to come from. It's going to come from the hearts of men and women, moms and dads, and out of homes uh, in, in, across this nation. And so when we're talking about some of these situations, and you bring up the fact that a biological dad would take his own child and abandon her and leave her in risk where she's going to be trafficked. It, to me, shows what has happened in this nation. Uh, the scriptures talk about um, bringing dads back home to their children. We have an epidemic here. We have a dad deficit. We have millions of dads missing in action. And so as we come into June and Father's Day, I wanted to talk to you about that. Give us your perspective. You've seen it all. I can't imagine the things that you have seen. What, um, 
I don't even know where to get, begin, Baz. How do we help America right itself? That's a great question. You know, um, if people don't follow God's guidance, so to speak, they have no moral code, they have no moral line uh, to toe up to, then uh, they rely on themselves. And, and, and when we rely on ourselves, we rely on the world and the world's influences, and therefore we act and behave as the world would act and behave. And the prince of this earth and of this world is, is Satan. So we know those influences exist. We know that it's more of a spiritual battle than anything else. Um, but as dads who are believers and dads who are not believers, the very first thing we've got to do in this nation is we've got to know what that moral code is. We've got to humble ourselves before God, and we have to do what God wants us to do. For example, I don't rescue kids because I think it's cool. I don't rescue kids uh, because we get coverage on it. We do this because God has called us to do this, and we're being obedient. And, um, and that's what God wants us to do. As godly men in this nation, it is not enough to say, I'm a godly man. You have to take what God has given you, and we have to act upon it. For example, when people ask us why we do what we do, we simply reply, if we do not, who will? And that's it. And I ask all the dads in the world, if you do not, who will? If you don't follow that moral code and be responsible and accountable to God for the way he wants you to act as a godly man, then who will? You'll leave it to the world for your daughters, your sons, whatever you, you, whatever you want to call it. And another thing faith-based men have to do is we've got to step up to the plate and quit being afraid and quit hiding behind God's skirt, so to speak. <laughs> you know, God, I mean, it's pathetic. And, I, and, I, and for the listeners out there, you know, I call you to this challenge because, and I'm not putting myself above anybody. But you, we get to a point where all of a sudden we have no fear because we trust in God and we're accountable to God. Now, I come from a long line of war fighters. Uh, I was a Marine. I was special operations. The people that I associate with now are, are Delta, former Delta, Navy SEALs, whatever it may be. And yes, clearly some of them are the bravest of the bravest. And that is what kind of that's what we adopt to, so to speak. Every godly man has got to meet that, that, that marker. That's what you have to be in God's kingdom. And you cannot hide behind it. And let me tell you what, if you are hiding behind that, and if you are not stepping up, toning the line, if you're not saluting the flag, if you're not being a patriot, if you're not standing up uh, against, uh, like you were talking about, the, 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 the government's educational program that's going to corrupt your kids once you know, learn more about it, um, if you're not becoming a voice in this nation and saying enough is enough, you might as well get off the playing field. That's it. Because guess what? We don't need you. And God doesn't need you either. And then God doesn't approve of, of fence sitters. We all know that. You know, he says, you're either hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Well, guess what? In our community of godly men, that's the consensus. You either step up the plate, you put your pack on, you do what God has required you to do, or you just get off the battlefield. And so how do we help so many people understand? Because many of them have just gotten off the battlefield. They've just gotten off, period, and walked away. And so how do we help either either these young men who are getting ready to get married or or young men and women before they ever take the, the plunge to get married um, and the dads who are in the home? How do we help them step up? up because they just seem so eager to let somebody else do it. And I think this is part of the problem. We think the public education system is going to teach our children. We think the youth pastor is going to give our children their spiritual faith. It's, it's, it's a buffet where we just drop our kids off here and there for someone to render their services and raise the kids that God gave us. And I find it very frustrating. And I know some women have to work. I get that. Some choose to work. That's your choice. If God's in it, he will, he will pro bring protections and put things in place. As you talk about the Red Sea, he'll put things in place for your kids and you. So I'm not decrying women working if they wish or if it's part of the plan or if they need to. But there are a lot of women who are forced to 
right now because of the situation economically. We've got a government who would love to have two income taxes coming from each home rather than one set of income tax, which is why we need to do away with that whole, I think, 16th Amendment. I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and check. But um, how do we help these parents come back and take charge? They see it. Boz, TV's full of the tough guy stuff. It's full of the fighters in the ring and the and the shows about competition and the survivor and all that. How do we get them to have that same mentality with their families that they will give up nothing and they will hold guard over their families? The first thing we have to do, uh, Tamara, is we have to... Oh, you know what, Boz? Before you start, I just looked yep. at my clock. I've got to go to break. I have to be better about watching my breaks if we're going to go on air. Sure. On radio. So we'll go to break right now. When we come back, you can give us that answer. I am sitting with Basil, Basil Boz, and we're talking about a variety of topics from dads missing in action across America to where we will finish in the Middle East on the treatment of women and finally with this soldier who was not missing in action, not a, pub, a prisoner of war according to what we're hearing now, but was AWOL. We'll have that discussion at the end of the program. So stay tuned. It's, it's uh, bound to be full of, of, of intrigue, I think. And uh, we'll stay, we'll come back right after these messages. We thank our sponsors and appreciate you listening in. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Save us! Help! Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! Hi, I'm Tom Coach from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. What's wrong? Logan wants Let's Rock Elmo for his birthday, but since Steve lost his job, I don't think we can afford it. What did you do for money last year when you and John were struggling to make ends meet? My secret? I went to me and Mommy T. We sold all of Megan and Ryan's clothes and toys there. They give back the highest percentage on their items in the area, and it was so easy. Megan's clothes? She's 15. Yes, they can sign newborn through trendy teens. We're not struggling now, but I'm going to keep saving and making money at me and Mommy T. All across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life-controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida has a unique approach to substance abuse treatment. Call now and ask about our guaranteed success program or log on to transformationstreatment.com. Transformations, change your life, change your relationships transform your world hey psst. let me let you in on a little secret you ready always try to do business with people not places especially if you seek honest christian business people and when it comes to my car i really need to trust who's working on it now my family is so blessed a few years ago we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open, honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart, and it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car, everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you and tell them Max sent. And thanks for staying tuned. I am Tamara Scott. You're listening to, Mar to Tamara Scott Live with Truth For Our Time. I do want to thank our sponsors and Crave. Crave has come on with a sponsor uh, sponsorship for us. They are out of Florida, but they're nationwide. ChristiansForAmerica.com is how you can find them. Crave, our citizens reviving American values every day. They do work as well with um, Danny Van Gundy out of Ohio on recovery. If you have an addiction, uh, uh, an alcoholic or a, a prescription drug addiction, um, as I've said in the past, I got a great opportunity to go and do a stadium event. A football stadium event was just a, a magnificent experience in working with Dan, and he's now continues to hold meetings for folks all over Ohio and a variety of other states that you want to bring him to. So we gladly partner with that organization if you want to call on uh, Crave or Christians for America. We're talking with Basil Baz, ARC, Association for the Recovery of Children. Um, he goes in and takes children who have been kidnapped either in a 
um, domestic situation, a, a kidnapping and a custody battle, but also those who have gone into trafficking and been kidnapped in that arena as well. But I had just asked him a question. Um, what do we do to help men today in America, young men or men in the family, to stand up and take guard of their families? Boss, if you want to go ahead and answer that question, thanks so much for being here. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, one of the first things we have to uh, do is um, come to the plate with an unselfish heart. That's what men have to realize. They have to be unselfish. In fact, any man who decides that he wants to have a family or have children has to realize that at that point, he's got to put himself second. Um, whether it's protecting his family, whether it's uh, feeding his family, whatever it may be. Um, what we have in America now is we have a generations that are um, all about me. Yeah. Um, and it's and they're, they're growing up in a very selfish uh, atmosphere. Everything that's promoted on television is all about me. How do I get mine? We look at Congress. We look at we look at our, our, our world leaders. We look at the leaders in the United States. It's all about me. We, we start understanding that politics are all about me. How can I get mine and how we use other people, how we abuse, how we consume, um, and how we lie to get what we want. And so this is the, the, the world that our young men are now growing up in. Um, so there's two things that will motivate a young man to uh, to to take action. Either he'll take it the wrong way or he'll take it the right way. If he's motivated by an unselfish heart and he understands that that's where he needs to be because perhaps he had an example of a father or a mother who are very unselfish and they set that example for him, then he's probably going to grow to be a well-defined young man who's going to be unselfish with his kids and everything's going to be okay. If you have a young man that did not have that example set in front of him and he doesn't understand uh, that it, that you need to be unselfish and that doesn't motivate him enough for him to be unselfish, then you simply need to let him know this. One day, you as a young man are going to be an old man. <laughs> and when you become an old man, the way you treat your kids is the way you're going to be treated. So if you abandon your children when they are young, if you are selfish, uh, if you're selfish and you don't care for your children, this is the example that they will, that you have set before them. This is exactly what they will grow to be a generation after this. So therefore, when you become an old man and you're in your 80s and you really need the help of your children and you're wondering why your children aren't visiting you or why your children want to dump you off and a care home, why they never call you, why they're so busy and so selfish with their own things in life, that's exactly why. You know, this is one of the best things about doing this show is I learn, and even those things I know, I am reminded of, and as a mother of four adult children, three of which are married and live on their own, what you're saying is a good reminder for me. If there's that balance as a mother, mother-in-law, you don't want to intrude and bother all the time, but I need to remain active and whatever interests them continue to be a part of that so that later on they are still interested in me. So that's a great remi reminder for me. Thank you very much for that. Um, I want to talk, you hit it on the head with the selfish mentality that we have. What's happening to our kids? Uh, I mentioned earlier dropping them off here and there for somebody else to raise them, to teach them, to train them. Oftentimes, these kids are plunked in front of the TV, and now even more frighteningly is the use of the Internet. We have no idea what they're watching unless parents are active enough to go in and do a history. We have uh, little idea of what they're seeing, all the characters that they know, the Twitter world, the Instagram, the Vine, um, things that they may be involved in that we have no idea. Boz, you're in the human trafficking aspect of it. We have girls who are now taking photos of themselves as a minor, so they're a victim, but they're also a perpetrator which makes it very difficult for a prosecutor to, to um, charge. What has happened? How do, how do we come out of this? Our kids are so corrupted at this point. How do we best come out of this? I think one way to uh, best shake us up is to hold parents accountable. I've always believed this to be true, and I've actually seen it actually work. For example, let's say we're dealing with a minor who commits a crime. I think the parents should be held just as accountable. Let's say you have a 14-year-old that 
bully somebody or wrecks a car or whatever it may be or is caught drunk or whatever and instead of or along with passing judgment on that child whatever that should be the parent should be responsible and you should pass judgment on that ch that parent as all well. also if, uh, if a parent uh, if a child is 16 years old or or, or a, a young adult and they're caught drunk driving, and now their license is suspended, and they're thrown in jail for 30 days. I think you should take the parent and throw them in jail too for 30 days, and say this is your child. You're responsible for them, and therefore what they do is going to reflect on you. And I think that's that's a quick way of starting to get parents involved in what their children are doing. If a child is uh, involved in pornography or um, prostitution. I think again, we have to go to the parent and hold the parent accountable. I'm, I'm, I believe with all my heart that if we start holding parents accountable for their children, of course, there's nothing you can do after they become adults. But prior to that, I think we'd start seeing things turn around a little bit in this country. If we did that, we might see a surge um, into homeschooling, or at least away from the public schools, because there is no way that you can hold parents accountable when these kids are being taught and trained the things they are in the public schools, whether it's pornographic text in the literature that they have to read. Uh, it, would be, it would be quite curious. And that, that leads me to my next question for you, what we're seeing on the college campuses. The violence that's taking place, uh, the rape, the sexual assault. Uh, campuses are now discussing it, so we're, we're, we're on the right path. But the way they're coming out with help is yet to be determined if it will be helpful or not. We now have the Yes All Women campaign because of the recent murders in California. You being familiar with that state, are, are you familiar with this recent shooting slash stabbing incidents? Uh, is this the one up in Santa Barbara? Yes. I am. Where he videotapes himself as such. I hate to speak out against someone I don't know, but... The, the tape comes across to me not as just a, a child hurting, but the arrogance in which he comes across in this video that that he deserves a right to have his way with any woman. Um, is this a mentality we're dealing with in America today? Thank you, pop culture. Thank you, uh, Hollywood. So I guess I, what I'm taking, we, how are we going to get this back from college campuses, from this generations of kids growing up with this mentality that if they want it the me mentality if i want it i can take it yeah we've desensitized america and we're continuing to do that with the use of pornography with what we accept on television as being the norm uh with the way we treat women as being the norm uh and not enough people particularly since we're talking about dads and men enough of them stepping up to the plate to say this is not normal and this is not right. We don't have enough people shouting, uh, shouting out against things like this. We don't have enough people. I'm not. I mean, I don't know if lawsuits do it all the time, but we don't have enough people suing uh, educational systems for allowing pornography in schools or making that acceptable. We as Christians have taken a back seat uh, to all of this and basically aren't marching forward. We're not, we're not a voice. And, and, it, and yes, it's true that God requires us to be in prayer. And, and I understand that. But he also, he requires us to be men and women of action. You know, Absolutely. it's great to say, be blessed. But are you feeding people? You Absolutely. know, take action. Paul talks about that. So are we taking action? And I don't think we, I don't think we are. We're not shutting down uh, pornography. There, there's an organization called, uh, Girls Against Pornography, which is led by an amazing Christian woman named Tiffany Lipper. And organizations like that are the ones that are getting out there and actually going to holding Department of Justice or Congress accountable. They're, they're trying to get laws changed. They're trying to uh, reinforce the laws that are already in place that says you can't have pornography sitting out in the 7-Eleven or whatever. So particularly in the state of California, as you know, in the Valley near Los Angeles, I mean, that's where the porn industry exists. And even within that state, they won't get rid of that pornography industry. Why? Because it brings in too much money to the state. So at 
we're bringing in money at the cost of lives of, of, of our young people. And so in this case, depending on what the motivation is or what this young man, let's say up in Santa Barbara, what he was influenced by, what did he see, what did he believe was okay, and not only what did he believe was okay, but what about the people around him that either A, didn't do anything about it, right. to say it's not okay, and make it their business. Because here's the, here's the, here's the glitch in it all. If you don't step up to the plate and tell people this isn't right, it's going to come affect you in your own backyard. Now, you just, you just hit something because you're absolutely right. You are absolutely right, and yet we're told in America not to push our values, not to push our religion, our faith on somebody else. But you're absolutely right. If you go into Joshua, they'd come across the river. They were celebrating all the obedience that they had done, the blessings that God had given them. And one of, one of the, the tribes, uh, I think it was the half-tribe of Manasseh or something, had built an altar. And here are these brothers and sisters and relatives ready to go to war with their own because of what they thought was wrong. And they were not going to let that sin be in their camp because a little sin would impact the whole camp. Exactly. So you're absolutely right. We've got to get back involved. We've got to quit buying the world's lies that we can't push our values. We can't talk about our faith because what we're allowing right now is the funding, the state funding, the tax dollar funding of, of human secularism, which is also a religion according to the Supreme Court of America. So we're allowing somebody else's values to be brought on us. I want to I want to take this further. We're talking about the Yes All Women campaign that came out of this um, incident and this tragedy out of California. One of the articles I have in front of me is um, called Yes All Men, and it's by Charles M. Lowe, and it is a New York Times article. I have to tell you, I don't agree with his comment about women being feminist, that every woman should be a feminist. Um, I don't like the connotation that comes with feminism. To me, um, there, there doesn't have to be a dislike of men. There doesn't have to be a, to be a strong female. I don't have to be belligerent. I don't have to uh, have a lifestyle orientation that's one way or the other. I can respect my husband, love him, and appreciate him for all the facets and talents and giftings that God has given him and still be a strong female. So, so I, I reject that premise, but I like what he's saying, that everybody should be out for the safety of women and the rights of women. And you and I talked about that just briefly the other day. Uh, women, uh, give us a little touch on that. Women can be strong without being what the world sees as a feminist. You, you can. You know, it's not about being a, about being a feminist. It's about just being a woman. You know, within itself, within on your own God-given right, as God defined you as a woman. I grew up with uh, a father who was a Green Beret and went off to war to serve his country, and a mother who was extraordinarily beautiful and still is, and yet had to be strong and had strong traits uh, and and disciplined her kids and handled the house and was an amazing and is an amazing woman. Still to this day, I have a sister the same way. They're beautiful women, and they have the best of both sides. They have the they're 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 females, and they're and they're beautiful, wonderful, godly females. And yet, they have intelligence, they have strength, they have character, um, and they have the ability not to let people push them around. And oftentimes, far more diplomatic than I can be in many <laughs> cases, to be honest with you. So um, I, I think that we have. In, in, our, in the world, we haven't taken a look at the scriptures enough and looked at really what God has provided for us as a male and a female and understood that he, he's given it to us all. So we keep trying to redefine things, you know, so, so that somehow it makes us a, a more powerful person or, or repositions us uh, a little differently. You know, and, and what we're doing there is we're trying to define ourselves as to what we do instead of who we are. And if you can figure out who you are and be okay with the fact that you're a son or daughter of the Almighty of this universe, of God Almighty, you'll find a lot of power and strength in that. You'll never be run over. You'll find balance. I mean, God has never put anything in his word that hasn't really kept us balanced in society and in this world. That's why our forefathers leaned so heavily on God for this nation and the creation of this nation. And so 
it, it what we're hap what's happening in society is if you if you tell a lie enough long enough people start to believe it it becomes the truth and so in America we're listening to the lies over and over and over and over and over that we start believing it and what is that lie well that lie may be that pornography is okay that lie may be that it's okay to be corrupt in government that lie may be whatever that it's okay not to be a great dad or whatever it may be as part of our discussions we're believing the lie and that's exactly what it is it's a lie and we need to get back to what the truth is and stand fast and hold to that truth and stand up for it and hopefully now that it's happened as you say in california close to the porn industry but even hollywood perhaps they might take responsibility for some of the wrong teachings for some of the um, um, per, the portrayals of women that they put on the screen and in the music videos. And I'm just going to read a couple quick um, um, statistics and then we're going to go to another break. But 83% of girls 12 to 16 have experienced some form of sexual harassment in the public schools. 83%. 140 million girls, women in, world, in the world have suffered from female genital, genital mutilation or cutting. 35% of women worldwide have experienced intimate partner, partner violence, non-partner sexual violence, and 70% of women have experienced violence in their lifetime from an intimate partner. This is, this is the mindset that men are starting to understand because of this conversation, the fear that women walk into an elevator and have to gauge what's around them in a parking garage or wherever they go because of the fear of what might happen to them. We're going to take a break right now. We're going to come back. And hope you'll stay with us. This is Tamara Scott, Truth For Our Time, and we're powered by Webcast One Live. We'll be back right after these messages. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I am Administrative Manager. I am the Senior Technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you gonna say that to a client? No. <laughs> you don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're gonna be listening. They're gonna to wanna to know what your challenges are. Then they're gonna come and give you options and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now and then leave and then come back, charge you again. And, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I wanna find why it failed today. How can we change the part today with something that you're not gonna have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me, but is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed right or it's free or 100% money back. Enough said.
And I am Tamara Scott. Thank you for joining us with Truth For Our Time. My guest is Basil Baz from ARC, Association for the Recovery of Children. We're talking about a myriad of of situations and discussions today because I believe they all kind of come together in the end, how we raise our kids, the mindsets that we give them, or how they treat their fellow man, their fellow woman. Uh, we've just I just gave you several statistics um, on what has happened, what women face, violence, the assault, the, in, the um, intent of assault, the fear of assault that women deal with. And I'm just now posting on Truth For Our Time Facebook page the story of the 27-year-old, uh, I think it's Miriam Ibrahim, I think, uh, uh, um, age 27, who has been sentenced to death because she married a Christian. She's of the Muslim, or she's said to be of the Muslim faith. You were born into that, apparently, and you have no choice about it. And so I don't want to get into the Islamic discussion, but here's this one more example of, of the suffering that women uh, take around the world. Baz, when we go over to the Middle East, um, I guess maybe I do have to get into the Islamic thing a little bit. Uh, America and women just can't understand, even what, with what we're dealing with and sexual assault, we can't understand the freedoms and the liberties that we have in this country, do we? You know, and, and in fact, it's interesting. I have spent probably the last nine months over in the Middle East working on a, a, another operation. So um, I've had the opportunity also to speak to a number of women uh, of the Islamic faith, uh, in certain Middle Eastern countries and get a pretty good feel of, of what goes on in their personal lives, not only socially, but also at, at home. And so for many of them, if there's a divorce, they don't get any say over it. And they certainly won't get to raise their own children in most cases. Um, they don't. And um, if I if I were a female, I, I, I don't think it's a place that I would really want to live. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Not knowing what I know now in America, the, the freedoms, you're, you're greatly restricted, and um, you're almost, in my personal opinion, you're almost in slavery. I think that's probably the best way to say that. We have Dr. <laughs> Stephen Kirby come on the show from time to time. He's written a couple of books on Islam, and we talk about the women. We've had guests from the Honor Diaries women who have suffered the violence because of Islam. Let's jump into the Middle East and what's happening over there. You, with your CIA intelligence work, your former U.S. Marine, and your work with counterterrorism. So the story that's hitting the news lines, the headlines lately, is this one with the officer who, when we heard the headlines, was a great rescue of a um, soldier who had been missing and now, as more stories are coming out, I look at the story from Chuck Todd on NBC. Um, they traded this soldier for five members of the Taliban who were held at Gitmo. Uh, I can ask you questions, Boz, or you can just kind of jump in and take us where you want to go with this. But first, let me just ask you this question. I didn't think that we negotiated with terrorist kidnappers. We don't. That's the law. And um, when this started to unfold... Our community, meaning the special operations community, uh, both active and former, uh, all became one voice uh, and had very, very heavy discussions on uh, on what we thought about what was taking place from the White House level and uh, on down, even with uh, Bertol. And um, we, well, not generally, we all came to the same conclusion, you know, that the president, uh, has played his his last hand pretty much with with veterans and people like herself, um, historically bypassing congressional approval on a number of issues. Um, and I say this, uh, I stand up and say this, it, appearing with the arrogance of the same type of the same type of dictators that we go to other countries to defend the innocent against, and being caught in one lie after another, starting with Benghazi and never being held accountable, nor those serving under him, such as Hillary Clinton. So in a time when the law clearly states that we shall not negotiate with terrorists, and he, the president, does this in a time when aiding terrorists is punishable by our laws, where an American would be immediately arrested by the FBI for doing such, the president of the United States has done so, and is clearly, in his opinion maybe, uh, above the law, uh, hypocritically positioned and never held accountable. Yeah. The, president has, yeah, the president has demonstrated 
and I and this actually this was this is a quote from a fellow special operations officer where he said the president has demonstrated and this is an officer who has been to Afghanistan on five different tours of duty, has lost a number of friends, um, and is wondering why we're turning over terrorists that we helped put in prison. He said, the president has demonstrated his allegiance to Islam, the jihadist mission to destroy America, and brings great concern for the security of the nation by releasing these five Taliban terrorists who, by our experience, will once again plot to kill Americans. Basically, the president has thrown the U.S. to the lions. Absolutely. I mean, how, how can we think anything different? And so supposedly they're going to stay in a certain locale for a year. Why would we believe that? Well, they won't. I actually know that area fairly well. And um, we just had a multi-billion dollar deal in Qatar, arms deals. Uh, Qatar is considered to be an ally, a strategic ally for that region for whatever reason. Uh, they produce a lot of gas, more than anybody that I know in the world right now. Uh, a number of U.S. corporations are wanting to remain in bed. You have the World Cup coming there. You have all eyes of the world on Qatar. Um, and yet we still have uh, times when um, agreements have not, uh, you know, have, uh, that, would, that other Middle Eastern countries have not abided by their agreements. So here you have five high-ranking terrorists moving freely in a country who, and, and by the way, in a country that has, has a history of saying that they would do certain things with terrorists and in the past, and that did not happen. So you talked about the president stepping outside the bounds of the Constitution, thinking he's above the law. Absolutely. Um, the story in, Do in Daily Caller talks about this NBC Chuck's Todd reporting from the White House. The White House expected euphoria. They expected uh, flag-waving uh, um, um, enthusiasm from the American people, and they were caught off guard by the angry response of Americans. They were. And I think, you know what's interesting? Lies begat lies. And so if we start all the way back, 9-11, where was the president? If we start about with ben Benghazi is still unresolved and they got caught with their pants down there in a lie, basically initially saying that, Everything that started off of the video, which it didn't, basically saying al-Qaeda wasn't involved, which they were, basically saying they couldn't get help to our people on the ground, which they could have. And so that hasn't even been resolved. And so the habit of lying or what is their character, so to speak, in this administration has just followed through even to this. And sometimes it blinds people. And in this case, I think they've been so used to doing what they've done, telling the lie, that they actually really thought they could get away with this as well. And I think it's not unfolding that way. And so do you know much about Bergdahl? Because we're hearing stories that not only was he not an MIA or not a POW, but he was AWOL. He does not like America. Fox News has a story on something about him being ashamed to be an American. I'm hearing stories of his father talking about um, getting every uh, detainee from Getmo freed. So have you heard about this? I've heard these through news reports, and I think I think I can best sum it up my opinion at this stage because I, I still think there's we a few other things need to unravel. I have actually talked to people uh, who have been on the ground with him. Um, you know, we we leave no man behind who served honorably for the service of his nation, and in this case, the evidence has been clear from the beginning that this soldier had deserted his unit in favor of possibly collaborating with the enemy then the no soldier left behind doesn't really apply here, for he is no longer a soldier of the U.S. in our eyes. So we have no doubt that after five years of incarceration that the White House had full knowledge of the circumstances of his misconduct, and yet the president attempts to convince America that Berdahl's a hero. It doesn't make any sense. And when you, when you mentioned that, a no soldier left behind who served his country honorably, I found myself cracking up because and I shouldn't be, I don't mean to be lighthearted about this, but it is the same thing we do with the scriptures. We say the one phrase we want, uh, you know, the greatest commandments to love your neighbor. We forget what it says before that, to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and obey his commandments. So the same thing here, the governor is picking and choosing, or the president is picking and choosing those things that suit him. And we've seen now the statement reduced to, at least I brought one more home. I brought one more soldier. 
sure. to safety. And so I'm hearing the reports that in in searching for him, whether it was when he was originally missing or more recently, that there were soldiers injured or killed. Is that the case? So we lost uh, soldiers while going after him? That's a report I've, I've heard also. I think one of the things we'll have to do is I think that uh, there'll need to be further investigations. I think that Berdahl should be tried and, and judgment passed through a military tribunal. Uh, and honestly, if he's found guilty, if, if someone were to ask me what should he do if he's found guilty, I would tell him, I'd say, if you're found guilty, do yourself a favor and leave the country because I'm going to tell you something. This is one thing among veterans and especially we who have lost our comrades in arms. This is something we do not tolerate. Treason, uh, the, it's, I, I can't even begin to express in my heart uh, how angry this makes good men and women who have served their nation and their country. And what makes us even more angry is to watch the President of the United States get caught in some lies about it, or the fact that he tries to make us believe that releasing five terrorists is okay, and yet turns right around in front of the camera and says, well, there might be a possibility, of course, that these five terrorists could come back and do us harm again. It's like, it's, it's incredible. It's just incredible. And what's even more incredible will be the fact if the American people don't do anything about it, right. if they don't force a congressman to do anything about it, if this president's not impeached for it, you know, uh, for breaking the law, if he's allowed to be above the law. I mean, it's just, these are the conversations that I'm having with other people from my community. So Bergdahl, we see it with treason, and you're, are you saying the president himself with treason? No, I, I'm not saying that the president is in treason, but I will say there is question. If we are not, if I were to aid terrorist, a, a terrorist organization, one terrorist, let's say five terrorists, if I were to to try to aid them in their escape or provide them with funding sure. or whatever it may be, the FBI would come and arrest me. Absolutely. And the As president it just did that. That's what the president did, and America needs to understand that the president of the United States broke the law. He didn't even ask Congress for permission to do it, supposedly. And here's another issue that's very interesting. We know that region really well, and we know the people that actually had him captive or held him as hostage. They're great money traders. I'll bet you we find out that somewhere down the line, if we investigate enough, that money was also provided to his captors, and that is a whole different ball game. When we're talking about the money that was provided, where did it come from, who gave it, and how much did we get? I'm writing that down. Can we tweet that out? Sure. Where did it come from, who gave it, and how much? Is that what you Yeah. Mean? Okay. Now, how does this fit in with Snowden? And I know we're closing down. This always happens. Uh, I always want more time when we get to this part of the show. We're closing down. How does this fit in with Snowden? Snowden was not a soldier. He was a contractor and blew the whistle. And we probably should just do a whole other show on that. But how does this work? Here's an American who can't come home. Well, here's an American that can't come home. But here's also an American, uh, after a lot of discussions, that actually showed America that the government that they trusted right. was actually lying to them again. Right, right. <laughs> so, I think the NSA and the government would have been far better off early on by just saying, we never we never spy on Americans, and, and or, or we're spying on you. We're going to monitor this and this and this, and, and, and allow the American people to digest that and make a decision in this country, because it is we the people, whether they felt this was appropriate or not. You know, in the old days, we had checks and balances. If you were going to tap somebody's line, if you were going to... If spy on their computer or whatever, I believe that you were required under law to get a warrant to do things like that to make sure that, you know, these, these things weren't abused. And, of course, that isn't what happened. So is Snowden a hero? Is Snowden a traitor? I, I, I don't know the entire Snowden situation. I've, I'm, I'm hearing from friends in Washington who are in the intelligence community that Snowden actually did not give anything up that was detrimental to the security of the United States, but basically what he did was just let everybody know that, guess what, the government's saying they're not spying on you, but they are. 
And so then the government came out possibly with that accusation to put him in danger and to build sentiment against him. And so here's what I kind of think, that it was not his intent to head to Russia, certainly, but felt that he had no other choice, and that's where he ended up going. And Putin will use this however he wishes. He's very clever that way. He's playing chess, and our president's playing checkers. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately, doesn't look like a match for Putin. Um, and so now we have a situation where I, I wonder about this young man's safety, what's happening to him there. He's behind closed doors. I, I have no idea. For, for the mother heart in me, it's very concerning. But uh, I certainly want to have national security at, at, um, at the front of our minds as well. So I don't know. Closing thoughts on that. Um, you know what? I have no idea what's happening to him in the Soviet Union either. Um, I do know that the Soviet Union, make no mistake, they are forced to be reckoned with right. um, and, and to some degree respected. Um, they have, were our arch enemies for many, many years, uh, particularly during my time in the CIA. You know, the KGB uh, were, uh, you know, they were, they were on their game most of the time. Uh, and you had to respect that in kind of an interesting way when it came to the world of espionage. I think that we are fooling ourselves if... We actually think we can tell Russia what it will or will not do, and um, they offered Snowden. I guess I, I guess they offered him sanction. Uh, what deals are being cut between him and them? I have no idea how Putin will use it. Uh, I have no idea. Putin is uh, has shown himself to be an incredibly creative leader of his country, um, so I'm sure he'll come up with something pretty ingenious. We are out of time. I thank you for taking time out. Our listeners should know I caught you while you were actually supposed to be having some vacation time. So thank you for taking time out and joining us. And if you ever have a situation, uh, something you want to bring to the American people, please at any time contact me. You always have an opening on this show. But I thank you for the work that you do on behalf of hundreds of kids, children, parents, and for the work that you do against trafficking, helping people understand pornography and the dangers of it. I appreciate what you're doing, Baz. You're welcome, Tamara. Thank you so much. God bless you, and thank you for your time on your show. To our listeners, thank you for staying tuned. You can find this and all of our other archives on Tamara Scott Live on YouTube. And if you want to learn more about uh, Tamara Scott Live, you can always email, it, email us at truthforourtime at gmail, truthforourtime at gmail, or find us on Facebook. And you can also find the Association for the Recovery of Children on Facebook as well. It's been a great, great hour of information. You've been given good information. Take it. Use it. You heard his challenge. Talk to your congressional members about impeachment, about justice, about national security. Why? Because your future does depend on it, and you can make a difference. As always, I tell you, be encouraged and never be complacent.